Our third uh, panelist, uh, Philippa Bull. Uh, Philippa is uh, the non-communicable disease advisor and leader of the chronic disease group in MSF uh, Switzerland. Her presentation will be on chronic non-communicable care in the in untypical refugee setting in northern Lebanon. Thank you. I'm interested, very interested. <laughs> Hello. Hi, so I move us, of course, to a very different setting now, that of the Middle East context and of a refugee setting, and how we um, look to address the management of a large cohort of non-communicable disease patients in this setting. So Lebanon is a country of um, almost hosting almost six million people at the moment. Of these, um, almost one, uh, there is approximately 1.2 million Syrian refugees registered in the country. And since the beginning of 2012, MSF launched um, the medical response to the, the big influx of refugees from Syria. And we are currently based in three locations, the cities of Saida and Tripoli, and the broad region of the Becca Valley. And in two of these projects, in the Becca Valley and Tripoli, we integrate non-communicable disease care into five of the primary health care clinics that we run. Now, just a note on Lebanon. The medical system there is highly privatised. It's, it's quite specialised. So, for example, patients with cardiovascular disease and diabetes are often used to seeing uh, endocrinologists and cardiologists. And there is quite a strong pharmaceutical lobby. So use of generic medicines is not that common and not that well accepted. There is a very high prevalence of NCDs in the region, as Fahd has already pointed out. For example, in Syria, before the war, the um, attributable mortality for, to NCDs was about 77%. So MSF so far really has relatively limited experience in the management of NCDs, and certainly not in this open refugee setting, where refugees were spread throughout the country and not sort of confined in camps. And in a middle-income contest, where the medical, um, the health system is quite different to the systems in many places in which we work. So therefore for us it was very important to understand the feasibility of the model which we implemented, which was different to sort of the existing model of care there, um, and to understand a couple of particular aspects of our program, one being a home glucose monitoring program that was implemented last year, the other to understand the high um, rate of defaulters that we found so that we could adjust the program appropriately. We therefore undertook a descriptive study using retrospective review of program data, data which had been collected in aggregate tables designed by the field team. Um, and so to, to, in order to respond to this high level of NCDs um, amongst these Syrian refugees, there are a couple of things that we needed to do, given that we didn't have existing tools or an existing experience on which to base the response. So one of the first things we, do, we did was to work on developing guidelines to support our teams. So these were based on existing international guidelines, but very much adapted to be simplified algorithms that could be easily followed by our medical staff and rationalizing the drug list from the sort of broad range of drugs that's normally used in the, in the country to a very essential drug list, and then also having a simplified list of investigations for routine follow-up of the patients. We developed a model of care which was based on a, a general practitioner system. So, and again, the general practitioners in the country were not so used to managing these types of patients, particularly the more complicated patients. So in a way, this was a type of task shifting we were already doing in this setting. But we task shifted further to use nurses to do the routine follow-up of patients and community health workers as a key um, part of the patient education team. Um, then we integrated this care into the, the, the primary health care where acute patients were be, being seen and we were also providing sexual and reproductive health care. But we, developed, we had an appointment system with regular follow-up for these patients and we had specified patient files that we developed. We had to support our teams with this, so we held a workshop in the country with some international experts to discuss with our field doctors and nurses on, on these protocols of management, and we have an international physician um, who's based in the field to support with the daily management. This is just a, an example of some of the, the guidelines that we developed and the type of um, patient algorithms that we have inside the guidelines. And then we have very much step-by-step -step use of drugs and we have tables to help the doctors um, shift patients from often the quite complicated medication regimes they're on to the more simplified regimens according to our essential drug list. 
Then in the middle of last year, we implemented a home glucose monitoring program. And this was to really assist our doctors who, one of the things they struggled with the most was the insulin management of patients. And this is in a context where many of the patients did not have access to glucometers or were unable to afford the quite expensive um, strips for glucometer use. And so our doctors were struggling to really adjust the insulin appropriately based on the, the measurements we were getting in the clinic. And so we designed a program where for select patients, namely those on insulin and those who are unstable on the insulin, um, but who were adherent to the program, so they'd been coming to us regularly for a period of at least three months, were given glucometers with a certain number of strips and instructions on when and how to use those strips. And really the objective was to help the physicians with adjustment of the insulin. We followed the patients with HbA1c's before provision of glucometers and at three months afterwards and had specific questionnaires designed for the, the patients and the practitioners at that three month mark and our infield expert did a file review of the, the files at this time. So in terms of the results we've had so far, I'll go very quickly through numbers but we've seen um, over 8,500 patients pass through our care um, between 2012 and 2014 of which three, almost 3,600 at the end of last year were in routine follow-up um, and had been seen at least in the last um, three months. And they re this, this represents about 20% of the consultations that are seen in our clinics. I won't go, as I said, in too much detail through this, but just to show that, you know, we still do have a significant number of defaulters, the 33% at the end of last year, which is why we undertook um, the defaulter analysis. In terms of the morbidities that we see, the most common diagnosis is hypertension followed by type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Now what this graph doesn't show is in fact the comorbidities and if you look at the number of diagnoses we have, it's more than twice the number of patients. So a, a large cohort of our patients are really being managed with multi-morbidities. The default of tracing, sincere apologies, there are some errors on this, we'll try and upload the right one after this um, in terms of the numbers. It, at the end of last year though, so look at me, not the, not the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of last year, because of the high rates of defaulters, the team actually did a complete file review and tried to trace every patient that had not been seen um, within the last three months. So they managed to, um, to find in both Becca and Tripoli about 30% of the patients. Um, and of these, they found that quite a number of them had actually moved locations, so some of them back to Syria and others within Lebanon. Then of the other reasons for defaulting, in fact, they differed a bit between the project locations, and the team found it was quite interesting to, to analyze these and see um, how to adjust the project and found a couple of things. For example, some patients had decided to stop taking their medication. Some patients had difficulty with access um, to the program and in Tripoli we were really drawing from a very wide catchment area and we've just in fact as of last week opened a new, pro a new clinic um, in the north of the area, partly in response to realizing that patients were having difficulty coming back to us for follow-up. Um, the team in Tripoli disaggregated the um, defaulters by year and certainly found the defaulter rates had decreased from 2012 to 2014, as had a number of the reasons for defaulting. So for example, one of the reasons for service dissatisfaction was long waiting times in the clinics and um, this decreased by 2014 and in fact in that time the team had made some quite significant um, emphasis on trying to implement an appointment system and um, decrease the waiting times and change the patient flow. The home glucose monitoring um, system, by the end of 2014, we had 85 patients enrolled in the program, the majority of these patients with type 1 diabetes, with a mean HbA1c of 10.28 on admission to the program. Now, unfortunately, at the time of analysis, we didn't have very many follow-up HbA1c. Of those we did have, all of them had decreased. We found that 61% of patients were self-adjusting their insulin, and in fact, this wasn't the primary or the initial objective of the program. It was initially to firstly help the, the clinicians with the monitoring and certainly 88% of them on file review were found to be appropriately managing to adjust the insulin according to the results. So it, it, it was providing, proving helpful for them. But certainly the team now will look at how to support the patients better as they are using this themselves. And, and in the qualitative questionnaires, patients were actually feeling a lot more comfortable having the glucometer at home with the management of their disease. So, in conclusion, <laughs> in 
Um, in terms of the defaulted tracing, um, I haven't gone through a lot of detail with that, but, but a lot of what the team found were things that they felt able to try and address if they were able to detect the defaulters in a more timely manner particularly. And so now they implement a routine system of trying to trace patients who've not been seen in three months to see what the reasons are for them not attending the clinic. For example, there were, were a small number who um, were unable to attend for uh, apparently being bed bound and we're going to have a, a system of social workers being able to do some home visits for these patients. Um, and so we will do this regularly from now on and then further review to see whether we need to continue. The home glucose monitoring results, um, I mean the initial results from both the the quantitative, the qualitative, but the very limited quantitative showed some improvements in the patient control. Um, but certainly we need to be monitoring that a bit more closely with our doctors um, to, to get better results out of it. In terms of the lessons learned from the cohort analysis, using these simplified protocols, having the expert to support our doctors has enabled this task shifting. Certainly at the beginning of the program, it was very difficult for our doctors to manage some of these patients, and particularly those on insulin, and then for the nurses to do the routine follow-up. But so far, this, this is, it's working successfully and we're, um, with, with these, this thing. And we've managed to rationalize the costs in the sense that um, we, we previously had a very broad list of medications. All of our medication is, is bought in Lebanon. Um, and there was a high use of investigations. And now we have these very simplified list of investigations and medications that are used. The appointment system um, and having the dedicated patient files and a dedicated patient service uh, circuit has allowed for improved follow-up of the patients. We were quite limited in this analysis, though, by some difficulties with the data tools, which were inconsistent between the projects. And at the moment, we're in the process of implementing a better data system that will be um, used throughout the mission. This will be an ongoing work. Um, the, the other significant component of the ongoing work is, is putting a lot more work and emphasis into the patient education system. Um, and we're looking at further areas of operational research, one of which will be looking at simplifying medication administration, such as use of the polypill for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. We've now been able to utilize components of the project in, in other settings. So in the emergency context in Iraq and Ukraine, um, we're able to utilize some of the things such as the patient files and the algorithms, as well as Syria and, and very different contexts such as South Sudan, where we adapt it to the context. Big thanks to the field teams for their work in this program. I heard that they, the teams in Lebanon may be watching today, so I hope they are, because I present on their behalf. And, and also big thanks to the Innovation Unit and OCG, who are the ones who helped us to develop the um, guidelines that we're using. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful group, all on time, so that's great. <laughs> I'm happy for that. So uh, starting with technical questions, let's start from the behind. Please, the lady in yellow. Doris from Vienna Evaluation Unit. Thank you very much, Philippa. I have just one question. If I have understood right, you said you have changed the uh, uh, drug regime to a less, to a simpler one. So I would like to know if you know how it was uh, accepted by the patients to have less <coughs> drugs and first change yeah. to another drug regime. Sure. No, in fact, and when I say simpler, it's really simpler compared to the existing context, not certainly compared to perhaps the way MSF would normally do it. It, it has been a very difficult thing, and it's required a lot of um, efforts in terms of patient education. And certainly um, in the, in the follow-up of default to tracing, one of the reasons for defaulting was dissatisfaction with the drugs or was patients deciding to get their drugs from elsewhere. Um, and, and in fact, that had slightly increased over time as we had actually rationalized the list. Because at the very beginning, we did have a much broader medication list in the emergency context before we rationalized it. So, so it is um, an issue. And it's something that, as I said, the patient support component of the program is something we're really putting a lot of work and effort into doing at the moment. Um, and we've just implemented we have now a new a, a dedicated patient support nurse. So as well as the normal nurse, doctor, and community health worker, we have someone to follow up the more complicated patients and provide uh, more ongoing education. In the end, though, I guess the, we, we are still seeing, hopefully, those who are the more vulnerable and unable to get medication elsewhere. And we still do have very large numbers in our cohort. So I mean, the acceptance is, is, is not, uh, it's not completely unaccepted. And we will continue to work on 
proper explanations to the patients to explain why these regimens are appropriate. For the clinicians, of course, it was also diff different to what they were um, doing, and this is one of the reasons we had this workshop with you know, international specialists to explain the evidence base, and we really made sure it was very evidence-based um, guidelines, um, and, and we could support the clinicians to understand that and how to utilize these drugs. Um, question, please. Yeah. Hello, um, Alvaro from uh, Action Against Hunger in Spain. Um, we have some, some programs in, in Lebanon in the, in the Bekaa Valley. Um, they're, they're actually cash transfer programs, and we are using uh, mobile phone technologies to communicate with, with uh, beneficiaries. I wonder if this is something you explore, and, and what would be your take on, on uh, using massive uh, SMS uh, uh, communication yes. in order to decrease default rates and also understand uh, what, what's the situation of the, of the cohorts? Thank you for the question. I'm going to come and talk to you after because it's something I'm very interested in. I'd be interested in your results. I ha we have discussed it within the team. And of course, we use this for the default of tracing. But we, we found significant difficulties in a number of patients who had changed telephone numbers regularly or the telephone number was not working anymore. We now have a system where we routinely try to collect a second phone number to, to facilitate that. But, but, I mean, the initial discussions, we, were, we weren't so sure, you know, how successful it would be in terms of the proportion of patients would be able to follow up. But it's certainly something we're thinking about, and I'll, I'd love to hear your experience. If I can have the privilege of being here also, I will not raise, but just to add the, the complexity of the situation, when working in a context of, let's say, Lebanon in this, in this case, which is very private system in terms of health facilities, where there's like a sort of you know, non-camp uh, refugees, there's no camps in, official camps in Lebanon. So I can, I can see how, you know, work will be difficult mm -hmm. to, to present sometimes a different approach for treating with a problem like uh, diabetes. A third question, last question now, so please. Hi there, thank you very much for that really interesting presentation. I was just wondering if you had a method, um, because you were talking about catchment areas, you were talking about access um, to these clinics. Um, did you have a method for identifying clusters of you know, high rates of N yeah, N NCDs and particularly, I guess, diabetes? N not in terms of identifying clusters as such. Um, certainly, we, we chose our clinic, I mean, in the Becker Valley, we chose our clinic locations strategically to try and cover um, not only different parts of the Becker Valley, but of course places where other actors, where there was less access to care in general, um, and also different types of population groups. And then in Tripoli, as I said, we were initially based in one location, but now we're spreading to another because we realized we actually, we do routinely collect information about where the patients come from and we realized we needed to spread elsewhere. Um, but in terms of the NCDs, not, we're not looking for clustering as such. We have done um, some access to healthcare studies. Um, uh, we've done a series of those studies, some of them quite recently, uh, at the end of last year, to look at um, different health needs and different aspects with access to health care. So I can discuss those with you later, if you like. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, um, um, Philippa.